I'd like to welcome back to the Business Web Practices Series for fall 2018 at Clark College, a graduate of Clark College, Mr. Jason Wright. Thank you, thank you, Bruce. Thanks for everybody who came tonight. I got a packed presentation, so I'm gonna move a little bit fast in some of the some of the areas here. I hope to keep you awake and not fall asleep as Bruce suggested. Now that was me falling asleep. Oh, oh. Not at your presentation. Yeah, okay, well that's good. Yeah. All right, brownie points, let's talk later. So I'm here to talk about the creative's journey to real success. Uh, let's start a little bit about me. Came to Clark College uh, back in, gosh, 2001. I spent the better part of a decade here. <laughs> uh, we'll get into some of the trajectory a little bit later, but I've been a creative for a good 21 years. Since I was about 14 years old, I had a camera in my hand or a pen or crayons or anything that would allow me to be creative. And um, this is me, <laughs> Halloween, and I was probably, gosh, five years old. Um, that is an image of my yearbook from Sacagawea Elementary School. And in there it says, uh, Jason's favorite subject is math. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> and uh, I enjoy drawing in my free time. And um, one day I want to become an actor or cartoonist. And so some kind of artistic medium and here I am today. So we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, process and what it uh, took to get me here where I am today and speaking to you. Um, right now I work for Web4, which is a digital marketing and creative agency in downtown Vancouver, Washington. And um, my title was changed recently to Chief Creative Officer. So it's been a, it's been a big journey from uh, going to Sacagawea and and uh, going to Alki, Skyview, to Clark, to the various jobs I've had, to the titles I've had, through the challenges, and uh, I'm here today. So I do a lot of different creative things, uh, probably to the point where I'm likely ADHD or something like that with all the like starting and stopping I do of different creative things. Uh, I do short films, short narratives, um, uh, for one time, for a period of time, I was referring to myself as a YouTuber, and uh, I was competing with people like uh, Young Lee from Gak Attack and Zach King from Final Cut King. Uh, you've probably seen him do his like short clips of uh, what's seen as magical videos. He did the Jedi cats and all kinds of stuff for a long period of time, and now he works in um, film. But uh, at the time, we were battling it out. Uh, and then I shifted, shifted gears to other creative work as things changed. This is me and my fiance and my dog, Leia. Uh, this is my, my family, the loves of my life. So we're gonna talk about from making the Bel Grande to becoming the Bel Grande. And I, I'll, you'll have more context about this in a few minutes. First, how did I get here today? Well. Hard work, time, energy, commitment, passion. Uh, some of those things that sound like token things that people talk about all the time. You gotta work hard and you gotta put in the time, and, but it's real. Um, if you keep driving and pushing your limits, you can and will succeed and expand. Um, and I'll give you some examples of that. Quick takeaway, which I'll recap at the end. Be a pest. Patience, effort, self-awareness, transparency. In order to succeed over the long term, whether you're 20, 30, 50, 70, you still have time, you still have so much potential ahead of you, and you need to be patient and work hard and, and really focus on the things that, that you want to achieve. Um, sitting around and thinking about wanting to do something or becoming something is not nearly as effective as just trying and doing. You know, I gave the example uh, last year of, of Bruce putting together Alexa skills and um, other people who have done creative works. It's, it's one of those things that if you apply yourself, 
you can achieve what you are hoping to achieve. So uh, before I continue, how many people in here are development focused? Raise your hands, please. All right, pretty much everybody. Um, what about graphics and creative? Okay, okay. All right, all right, good. So here's my career tra trajectory. I started at Taco Bell. Taco Bell was my first job. Uh, I was a junior in high school, went to uh, Skyview High School, took the bus to Taco Bell, and that's where um, things began for me. And throughout my uh, career, I moved to uh, cashier and all the way through to my first agency. But back when I was a cashier, um, my, my, I was struggling at Clark for a period of time. I failed math, uh, I failed math 30, I failed math 90, failed math uh, 95, and I kept going and going. I went to calculus, I failed calculus, and I failed it again, and then I had to like stop and reset because I was ultimately going for a program that my parents wanted for me as opposed to going for the program that I knew I wanted to be a part of. Um, so it was, it was a tough period of time because uh, I was considering maybe dropping out or you know, really trying to reset, which was gonna be pretty much at my own expense. At the time, my dad told me, uh, you should stick to what you're good at, which was being a cashier at Albertsons. But I knew that was not uh, a long-term plan. It's not what I wanted to be when I grew up. So I, I kept working, went to Clark College, uh, met someone here by the name of uh, Derek Jesser, who's presented here before, I believe. Um, he introduced me to a company called Doug Williams and Associates. And uh, he had been trying for actually a couple different, uh, for a few months to get me into there to sit down with someone and, and talk with someone. When I finally did, I sat down with this lovely lady in the back, Trisha, and uh, the owner, Doug Williams, I interviewed, I remember I brought in a binder of my uh, Clark College work, which I still have, by the way. Um, I brought it in and, and showed some of that, which you're gonna see in here, and it's fairly terrible, but I got the job, and uh, the rest was history. I was at Doug Williams Associates for, um, gosh, through its various, acquisitions and iterations for about six or seven years and um, in 2014 I transitioned to Web4 and I've been there ever since so about four and a half years. Overall I've been in the industry for about 12 years, 12 years in January. So this is just a visual for you that kind of shows how things progressed and changed over time by starting as a food clerk at Taco Bell in 2000 to now being chief creative officer 18 years later. So, you know, there's a lot of time and energy that's gone into this. When I came out of Clark, I was like, I'm gonna get into the graphics, you know, thing. I'm gonna like build stuff and it's gonna be crazy. And when I started Doug Williams and Associates, I was building WordPress blogs and doing link building for SEO. And over the course of a year, year and a half, when blogs were the thing, and you were doing things like mousetrapblogs.com, uh, I produced 50 to 60 of those in, in a year. One day the boss came in and said, what do you think about project managing this account that came in? And from that point forward, I was project manager and later operations manager and that kind of stayed with me for a long period of time. Um, we'll come back to this a little bit. So words and feel, feels. Life is a marathon. So if you're building apps, you're building sites, you want to build the next big social media app, you have to understand it's, in many cases, a long game. Uh, you don't achieve what you want to achieve in very short amounts of time and set high expectations for yourself. You have to keep building, growing, fail, start again, and keep going until you, until you get to where you wanna be. Um, some cases where, where I had uh, discovered going through that process of failing also taught me what really mattered 
to me, like from a deep internal level. Well, there were periods of my life where I was trying really hard to be something that wasn't really something I actually enjoyed. It's because someone else said so, or the other voices in my head that was taking me that direction. So I, I told you about my, my dad who said, you should stick to what you're good at, be, be a cashier, right? Um, and obviously from his standpoint, he's not necessarily trying to be mean, but when you're 16, 17, 18, that, that hurts when you've spent the last four or five years like failing and trying to succeed and failing and trying to succeed. And it wasn't up until the last year or so that I have adopted this concept of uh, eliminating the noise and eliminating the negativity. Because there's a lot of people who are gonna, who are gonna come across you throughout life who are gonna um, bring you down. And it doesn't matter what your role is, how fancy you think you are, um, how good you might be, there will always be someone who comes in to interject uh, what you're doing and bring in negativity. I presented at the Chamber of Commerce in March of this year and was heckled at the end of the presentation during the QA section uh, and uh, was, was informed that I was, I was grossly incorrect in how I see the future of technology. In that moment, you could get super defensive and be like, oh man, you, you like, all right, like, you don't know what you're doing, you don't, uh, you have no idea. The, the thing that I really wanna push is that even in my uh, 18 fancy years of being where I am now, there's still people who are going to bring you down. It doesn't matter how many talks you do or how many apps you build. I mean, look at Zuckerberg, look at the different people who've scaled over time. There's still, sometimes for, for good reason, but there's still gonna be negativity no matter where you go. So the, the sooner that you can get to that state of filtering the noise, the better, because if you focus on positivity, that's gonna help drive your future forward. Um, just remember that the story that matters most is yours, and um, I, I, this is something I have in the back of my mind all the time, trying to filter, again, the negativity, the people who say you can't, filtering that stuff out, and focusing on your story, and building up your story over years and years and years and years. So, I talked about this earlier, you have to put in real work, and you at sometimes have to grind. And um, I'm gonna lead into this with some examples. This beautiful thing. <laughs> this was my first, one of my first designs ever of a website using Flash, if anybody knows what that is. Actually, does anybody know what Flash is? Mm -hmm. Okay, just, yeah, that's, that's how dead it is. Um, but yeah, look at that, look at the gradient usage. I mean, isn't that something special? Like I discovered borders and strokes and gradients and you know, I really went all out on this. And then I took it to the next level. Um, this was actually my capstone uh, right before I graduated from graphics communications program back in 2007. Um, so I, that's my second iteration of my website that actually went live and Clipper Culture, uh, Larry, I want to say Larry, why rather? I think that site's still up. So I think if you go and look for Clipper Culture, I think that site's still there. Um, but yeah, it was my capstone. <laughs> then I moved to this. You know, I saw the matrix and the rest was history. <laughs> um, you know, the, the dark uh, background with the green and the, and the white, which, you know, these days uh, designers We'll look at you and be like, yeah, I didn't know what you're doing. Yeah, because no one can read that. Because uh, it's very hard for white text on uh, dark backgrounds for people to read that, especially with uh, people with uh, vision impairment and other things. And then this is where, where I'm at today. So progression um, is what I'm, what I'm trying to show. Starting from here, uh, scaling up over time to these different Variations, and so if you go to the rightjason.com, you'll see this uh, current iteration of the site. Here is some other lovely pieces of work which 
I, some of these I actually brought into my interview with Doug Williams and Associates. Uh, Daily Insider used to be, I don't know if it's still running, but it used to be an online news source uh, that we created, I created a little bit, a little design for the uh, Adorned, I think it was B-Adorned back then, bottom right corner, was my, it's like the Dreamweaver client project. Yeah, so there's a, there's a long history of things I've done. The digital art gallery was something that um, was a uh, C-Tech group by Bob Hughes, I believe, that, that we tried to start up and we created this like Clark College art gallery site and we started building it out. Yeah, craziness. I don't wanna talk about it too much, but. Um, I will come back to this as well. These are just little snippets of magazine covers that I created for a fake magazine called The Earth Magazine, super original. Um, but I was inspired at the time through InDesign, uh, through the InDesign class and David Carson when I was studying his work. Um, the point of me showing you all this stuff is that growth requires sets of actions over time to scale your skill and ability. Um, if you want to be a painter, you aren't going to be a painter if you don't paint. Like you gotta, you gotta paint stuff over and over and over and over until you get better and better and better. These are projects I'm designing today, which um, you know are much different. And some for large brands, some for uh, local brands. And by the way, when I was here a year ago, I was not doing anything creative uh, for the most part. I was managing people managing operations, uh, managing spreadsheets, sales numbers, and um, through a change of focus for myself, I started going in a new direction. So these are some designs, uh, one for Giuliano's Pizza. These are some more designs here that I've been producing recently. Um, here's, here's more. So just showing, again, progression, the work. Uh, I know it's pretty blurred out and fuzzy, for you guys, but I'll share the deck afterwards so you can take a look. Here's another one that I did, a bunch of interior pages. Hmm, really happy about some of those that are on the screen right now, not as much with some of the others, but again, it's doing, learning, expanding your skill set. Now, here's something that's probably, maybe going to surprise you. Six of these projects were absolutely free. So, the reason why I'm going to double down on this particular topic is because I did many of those projects for free, either inside of agency or outside of the agency on my own. And the reason for that um, is that I want to grow my skill set, and the best way to do that is to work on real things as much as you can and get those real experiences. They provided me a real challenge. Uh, I purposefully didn't pick things that was going to be one giant hero image with a line of text and a button. I wanted to get really complicated with it, at least complicated for me at the time. I wanted to grow my skill set, my portfolio, and go from being the guy that's really good at scheduling meetings and setting up spreadsheets to the guy that has a really great eye for design and shape and uh, structure. So I focused a lot of my energy on this. And again, this is only in the last 11 months that this sort of turnaround started for me. Um, so I showed you the comps over here. These here. Anyone know who Theo Rossi is? Sons of Anarchy uh, fans, Luke Cage fans. Um, you can look him up later. Anyway, so I had reached out to him on Twitter and I said, hey, um, I'm going to do this thing. And I actually slapped on it. I told him that I was in the Go Get It Life brand, that I was going to go and work on a comp for him. Just because I met him in person, I liked his style, talented actor, I liked his brand and what he was doing, and I was inspired, about, uh, inspired by that at the time. So I told him, I'm just going to make a design for you. I didn't ask, I don't need permission. I'm, I mean, really for me, I'm just screwing around, right? Like I'm 
I don't know what I'm doing. Like, I'm trying to figure out what I'm doing. I gotta steal assets and logos and I gotta put things together. Um, I told him that a long time ago and I started the project and stopped the project because I needed to focus my time on managing spreadsheets, sales numbers, and <laughs> scheduling, and project management. And in between there, I found um, an opportunity to kind of scale back, delegate, be able to work more on creative things. So I got back to it. Then I tweeted him and said, hey, I did it. Here it is. I presented the comp in that like screenshot there. Um, I sent a, a link to him through direct message to all the comps. I also recorded a design presentation overview, just webcam, YouTube, uploaded it, posted it, and you know got a response. Here's, here's one of the key things that I'm, I'm trying to get across here. Uh, the left, the left, left image is Twitter, the other image is Instagram. So I've had no engagement with him on Instagram, by the way. He saw me tag him in Instagram and followed me from Twitter to Instagram. The whole point here is I can take that just like I did right here and explain this story now because I took the effort to engage, I made the effort to just make something, and I've been continuing to work on projects for free to keep building up my own skill set but also my brand. Um, engaging with people, depending on what you're trying to achieve, if you one day want to try and raise uh, venture capital or business partners or bring in more developers for an app idea, the, one of the best things you could do is just engage with people. It's easy to be locked in a room, in a hole, with the blue lights on and the music and get into your zone, but you also have to engage with people. That's ultimately where a lot of your opportunities are gonna come from. So this is, this is an interesting one for me, and um, I don't know how this is gonna go over, but there was a time 12 years ago where it wasn't really cool, it wasn't seen as cool that a male could be a designer. There were male designers, but it wasn't as cool. It was more like, oh, you're, you're a designer, that's cool. Versus like, oh, you're a UX designer? Wow. Um, at the same time, it wasn't that cool for a woman to be a developer. And it was like, oh, you're, you're a developer, like really? Can you, can you, do you really have the development skills? Like, oh. and, and it's very funny how over the course of time, just even in the last decade, how much it's broken down. Even when I worked at Doug Williams and Associates, all the, des the designers were female. Even though I wanted a design job, I was never moved into that role because it just didn't, it's like, it's not what I should be doing as a man. Um, it's just, it was a different vibe. The first time I had interviewed a female developer was at Web4 in 2015. So it's just interesting how over time the barriers come down. Um, now it's cool that women are developers and dudes can design stuff and, and you know, we're gonna continue breaking down uh, more barriers as time passes. <coughs> so this is my dramatic pause. <laughs> Hopefully that makes sense though. Um, things always progress. Things always continue to move forward. Uh, we can't stop momentum. And every new generation that comes along is gonna push something else into the next uh, thing, whatever that is, breaking down the next set of barriers because we are evolving over time. So talking about my creative process, um, it breaks down to understanding, analyzing, and tasting or trying. You can use whatever term you want there. But then that can break down into all kinds of things. App development, skill development, uh, design stuff, all kinds of things. I typically try and first understand the goals and objectives of the client or the individual I'm working with, and then analyze data if I have it to help uh, dictate what I do next, which is taste and try. 
one of the one of the big things in the first 10 years of my career is that websites were like a set it and forget it. I designed it, I'm done. Guys, I'm done, it's built, we're good to go. That's changed, it's changing a lot. Uh, there's a lot of agencies now that are charging clients on a retainer basis to continually basically design their site, alter it, add a new feature, add new customizations, change up the homepage. So it's becoming more and more important that you get more analytical about what you're doing from a creative standpoint, then also building sites that can expand, they run fast, uh, they're friendly for the user, and that they match creative to the best of your ability. So this is an example of, of trying stuff. And these were, you know, the, the fun uh, magazine covers I was working on. And I was just playing, uh, but, I, but I didn't enjoy it as much. So it was one of those things where I did it and I thought at one time, I'm gonna like work for Time Magazine and do covers one day. And as I started making covers on my own, I was like, mm, okay. If I'm not finding this as much fun doing it for myself, then going through 12 layers of approval at a huge, company is probably not going to be the most fun thing and also battling it out with probably dozens of other creatives. So um, taking a step back, you know, I said those different comps and things that I created were free and um, for me it all came back to leverage. When I wanted a job as a designer, I would say I want a job and I want to design stuff with nothing to show for it. And I had no leverage. I had nothing to lean back on and say, oh yeah, um, I want a design gig and I've done this, 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 this. Didn't have any of that. So as you are thinking about producing work, um, doing your own stuff, freelance gigs, whatever that is, uh, keep in mind that the power of, of there's a lot of power in, in doing work for free to build leverage in the long run. Because now, I can walk into a room like this, I can walk into other situations, I can walk into meetings with other clients and say, yep, here's all the work I've produced. I produce work for Theo Rossi, I've produced work for uh, what used to be Southwest Washington Medical Center, and I have a whole background of things I can then lean on and prove. So inspiration for creative work, I mean, it comes back to understanding, analyzing, and, and testing. I often uh, do the thing that a lot of people do, which is start with Google. You know, if I have a new creative challenge that's on my plate, uh, I don't just open up a file or a, a coda and start ripping stuff out. It starts with understanding what you want to achieve, what kind of pieces do you want to take from where, maybe you're building an app, well, what part of Instagram do you love, what part of Snapchat do you hate, what part of Facebook do you like, and you start piecing together what your future, um, you know, app or program or site is going to be. And that works in so many different ways. Um, I, in terms of building assets for design, I will go and like, take images, take screenshots. I'm redoing Web4's site right now under the code name Phoenix, and I'm looking at Parliament, I'm looking at Gravitate, looking at a number of sites and ripping elements from those sites and putting them on basically a whiteboard for, for me to review and pick out the things that I like the most about each to create my own, um, my own iteration. So, when I was working um, for Doug Williams Associates, there was a time where I was doing some PHP and um, some database work, and you know, copy and paste was my best friend. Um, I used all kinds of resources, uh, anything between php.net to scanning forums to bashing my head into a wall and then leaving for a while and coming back and looking at php.net again and starting over. But 
for most everything we do, it starts with some form of education, or research, or filling in knowledge gaps. Like I couldn't tell you the first thing about how to build out um, a custom you know, array from scratch, but I would go find the code on php.net. I understood PHP enough to go through and hack it to death until I got it to where I wanted it to be. My design tools, who's familiar with Sketch? One, two, heard of it. Okay, a couple. Uh, Sketch is the big design application that's out there right now for designers. <clears throat> Adobe is sort of in a battle with Sketch in terms of attention and usage, but um, people migrated to Sketch because of its development integrations and its exporting of code features that they have in there to help streamline the development process. But um, I don't use it because I am a big fan of Adobe products, so I primarily use Adobe XD. And it's funny because I got some hate for this recently when I told someone I used XD, and they're like, oh, that's a wireframing tool. I'm like, mm, it was, but it's not anymore. It can do that, but they're actively working on a program that brings some elements of Photoshop and some elements of a program that uh, they used to have called Fireworks and creating the best of both worlds while also giving you features from Envision. Does anybody know what Envision is? One, okay, uh, two. So Envision is basically a tool that allows you to uh, take your mockups and link them all together. So you can kind of show what a menu it's going to look like by clicking on it. You can make it a little more interactive. This is a key component to creative work uh, today. And this leads me into process which, or more process stuff. The more stuff that you can um, do in less time, so more value you can provide in less time, the better. What you're looking at, and it looks not so great up there, but that is uh, kind of messy too, actually. But uh, that's my master design file. I've established a bunch of core layouts and core graphics and uh, symbols and colors and images that I can drop uh, into the uh, design spaces that I have, into the artboards, and start producing things fairly quickly. All of this for me is done inside of Adobe XD, and I switched to prototyping mode, which is a button at the very top of the screen, top left. You can't see if you're sitting further back. But um, that's what allows you to connect everything together. So like a finished comp for me, it looks like this. And then I create the prototype and I link everything together. And I send the client a link and they can kind of click around and they feel like it's a real um, live site. Now in terms of winning inside of an agency, whether it's development or design, you, you need the content first. You need to understand the content and features 100%. Reason for that is because if you don't have 100% approved requirements files or 100% approved content, you run into a situation where you might have to rebuild a custom plugin you made in WordPress using ECF. You might have to redo your comp altogether because you thought it was gonna be 900 words and client gave you 150 and now you're really screwed and you gotta like pick a bunch of random images and fill in space. So in, in the process, wherever you go in the future, um, always push the concept of having, whether it's development requirements or content, make sure that that stuff is done up front. Uh, the best agencies get that stuff done up front. And um, I can go into it more, but I, I won't. And I, you know, I already stated this, if, if you don't have those approved features, you don't have that approved content, it can just annihilate your creative work uh, to the point where sometimes you have to start over. This, this is a big topic for me, and, and this, is, this was important for me, and it may not be as important for you, but understanding that your creative work, while you might feel it's your baby, your app is your baby, your design is your baby, Ultimately, it's, it's not because you're making it for someone else and those people are gonna judge that work and they're gonna have their own ideas and concepts that they wanna interject 
into it. We see this all the time when you work with um, people who are more like artists than I would say web designers because there's, there's a little bit of a different flow. What I do is I take different assets and I put it together into a comp that I think works. Artists need to kind of feel something about it. They need to kind of like take a few days or a week and, and kind of get into the emotion of it and have a better flow. They also become way more attached to their work because of it. Um, so you have to be careful that when you're putting things together that you should be open to criticism uh, because sometimes that criticism can lead to breakthroughs you haven't thought of before, new ways of thinking. <clears throat> Something that has been really effective for my team, especially recently, is continuing to focus on relationship. If you're in a team of 14 people, you need to collaborate, and you have to collaborate often. Um, in order for you to be successful, you have to have a strong line of communication with each other, especially if you are doing development work that a creative is supposed to look at later, or creative work that's getting handed off to a developer, you have to make sure that there's an open line of communication and collaboration there and a mutual understanding on both sides. Sometimes a creative will produce something that's like, why do you have a blur over an image with a drop shadow and this bevel with the border on the right side at five pixels? And the developer's looking at you like, you honestly don't know what you're doing because you can't, like, you can't really achieve that in, in this. And it creates a situation where uh, you have to go back to the drawing board, in some cases from a design standpoint, and rethink a whole element because you didn't consider uh, the, the functionality that was actually possible based on the way that you're developing out the site. <coughs> um, in, in terms of, I see this all the time, I've been doing this a long time, there's always going to be revisions to your work. Always, 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 always. Because everyone's got an opinion. Your comp is gonna be changed three, four, five, six, eight times. I recently did a project that cost me 10 times more to produce than I sold because I had to get through 11 comps before the client would approve. And it was a matter of, can you change the gradient to go from here to here and make it like 20 pixels taller? And then I would come back and say, actually, can you put it back the way it was and instead move the button? Okay, yeah. Oh, you know what? We actually met and decided that you should move the gradient back how you had it. And so you're going to go through these, these iterations in this process. Some clients are easier, some clients are harder. And it's important for uh, you to understand that it's going to be a challenge. The more that you can filter out your personal feelings about it, and think more logically about the situation and understanding that it's not your baby, it's theirs, and they just, it's, it's their Cadillac, and they just want the right kind of interior and the right color. And, and when you get into that mindset, it kind of changes your whole percep perception of, of what they're trying to achieve. So, already mentioned this, but developers and designers must coexist, they have to work together. Um, we've created some new processes in our workflow so that if I design something, client doesn't see it, account manager doesn't see it, it goes to the developer first. Developer looks at it and says, yeah, looks good, or mm, I don't know why you did this, we no, can't do that icon there uh, without taking 20 more hours on the project, which when you get into an agency, agency setting, you don't have unlimited amounts of time to do stuff. Um, you have 20 hours of budget, 10 hours of budget, whatever that is. So the developer will come back and say, you know, hey, this is not gonna work, and that's perfect because it gets back to me before a account manager is even involved, before the client sees it, then to do everything so backwards where the client approves a comp, then it goes to development and developers like, Oh, damn it, you did it again, like you included that icon where I told you not to do it. Um, instead of getting to that whole situation and creating a bunch of feelings, it's, it's better to head it off at the beginning by having a better workflow overall. 
I say this all the time. Be hard on process, easy on people. Um, show of hands, if there are any, who here knows someone that wants to do bad work? And that's my point. Nobody wants to do bad work. Uh, they don't, nobody wants to do a poor job. We all want to succeed. There are better app developers. There are better website developers. There are certainly better designers than me. Um, but nobody you know, is trying to do a bad job. So that's why I always say hard on process, easy on people. Where in the process did we fall down to the point where you thought it was more suitable to take development this route or design this route? And what can we do in the future to fix that? Because ultimately, I mean, it, ultimately we're, we're all uh, just trying to learn. And you know, I pulled this stat, 81% of employees would rather join a company with open communication over some specific benefits. But why do you think that's the case? I mean, you don't want to get fired for doing a bad job. And you would prefer a, a place where you can have open communication, share your frustrations, uh, be course corrected, as opposed to being written up or fired because you produced a bad site. One of the first things I produced at Doug Williams and Associates was a metal roofing blog. It was the first thing I did. And I, I think it was maybe like, I felt like the first thing I did, it was the biggest thing I can remember, but uh, I produced it, sent it to the boss. About 10 seconds later, you hear, coming down the hall and it's like, okay, boss Skelet, did he even look at it? Like, I don't know what's going on, guys. He comes in and he takes his glasses off and he does this thing and he says, are you done with that? I was like, is that really, do you think that's done? Because that's garbage. And uh, I was like, I just, uh, you know, start, it's like I'm about to get uh, sacrificed. And it's like, I just graduated, I just started here, I don't know what I'm doing, kind of doing. And he's like, that, there's, there's not even this, there's not even that. And he was hard on people, he was hard on me in that moment, but I also worked in it, improved what I could. Uh, it, was a, it was one of those things that was like, in that moment though, you wonder, oh God, is this for me? Like I did that horrible and like, should I even be here? And did I take someone else's job that should be here instead of me? Even when you might have the right mindset, as I've mentioned earlier, there are people who, who don't have that same way of thinking and they will come in and try and destroy you and if you continue to focus on the process and what you can do to improve the process that's going to help you build up your skills and help you get out of tough situations down the road so in terms of agency work uh, i won't go over all this but Agencies who are hiring are oftentimes now more than ever looking for people who really fit within the culture. That's the first thing we look for at Web4 is people who fit within the culture. Uh, do they have the right set of values? Do they have the right mindset? Are they open to growing, learning, and expanding? Uh, I, I uh, for a period of time, you know, in, in the agency world, you kind of were just looking for people with skills and things have evolved dramatically. I mean, uh, when I worked for DWA, it was all about like, can this person do the job? Do they have the skills? And well, we kind of like them. Versus now at some of even the bigger agencies, it's like, okay, well, they need to be talented or seen or appear to have the talent, but they also need to be well-rounded individuals with a somewhat likable personality at times at least uh, because you are going to be collaborating hev heavily and this is a relatively new industry um, in reality I mean I remember the days where there was not internet and I remember the days where there was uh, dial-up and you and your brother had to fight for the dial-up 
connection um, endlessly. But this is a relatively new uh, service, this new world, and it's going to keep expanding. And as it grows, the people that can do the job is going to change. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the kind of skills agencies are looking for are going to change. And then now we're sort of heading into the era of culture, telecommuting, and uh, work-life balance, job joy. Some of those things are starting to scale in the industry. Uh, so if you are at a, a point wherever you are in your education, uh, even beyond that, just keep in the back of your mind, what can you do today or tomorrow to help build leverage. Um, that's, that's one of the things that has helped me be successful over time is uh, to, to have built up leverage through the designs, through things that I've done, through the portfolios I've generated um, has, has given me the kind of skills and abilities I need to go to the next project and the next project after that. If if you're not sure where to start in terms of marketing yourself, it starts with just one, having work to show off and share, but making sure you have a website set up, making sure your LinkedIn account is set up, having your <clears throat> background in there, your experience. Um, if you gave a presentation for class, include that into SlideShare, like just start building things over time and realize, again, it's a marathon not a not a sprint. Uh, it, you're you're in it for the for the long haul. The other thing that you want to consider in terms of building your own brand is being active in your community. Whether that's uh, Slack developer channel, whether that's um, on Twitter through certain groups or other platforms, engagement and relationship is also a big part of the unlock. I wouldn't be here right now if Bruce hadn't known Kevin, who then Kevin referred to me, but Kevin also, Kevin's the owner of WebFloor, um, also presented Van Talks, and like things just work in strange ways, but it starts by knowing and meeting people and branching out. Um, specifically too, if you're looking for a job, or you're getting, maybe this is your last year, or a year and a half, or whatever it might be, Start thinking about who you know and who you don't know and what you can do to know more people. There's the Van Techie events, there's um, SEM PDX events for marketing. Web4 has digital marketing quarterly. We often take part in tech tours. And I will tell you one of the most impressive things that happened out of the tech tour um, recently is someone came in and he said, hey, I'm so-and-so. He had a letter that he had, had written and printed out with my name on it. Um, he also provided a resume and another uh, piece of material inside of a folder, handed it to me, and that, la that left a lasting impression as opposed to walking up going, hey, so you got, a, you got jobs here? That's, that's, no, like you're not, it's a different world now and you have to approach people from a relationship standpoint. Um, so the best way to get a job in an agency, as I see it right now, because I am the hiring guy at Web4 as well, is that you have, you have to get out of your comfort zone and be willing to just meet people, say hello, go out for coffee, um, you know, chat at lunch, uh, ask for a little bit of time, and grow from there. And, and you know, for people like, for people like me, Web4 may not have a job, but I know many of the agency owners in the area, and I know who kind of looks for what on a regular basis. So the reality is that each person you know probably knows someone else who can maybe, you know, bring you in or, um, you know, create a little introduction for you, which is which is how I got my job at Web4. I was not looking for a job. I had a job. And uh, David Portney referred me over to Kevin. And David Portney is a guy that I worked with at Doug Williams and Associates. And he left to go work for a big uh, enterprise agency. 
So because I had that connection with him, and I actually hired David originally at Doug Williams and Associates, uh, and he left and referred me over to what would be my future boss, and now where I'm at in my career. So remember, be a pest, create leverage. Uh, you have to put in the work. That's, that's how you get that leverage, is by putting in the work. And uh, the last thing I will end with is kindness, compassion, respect are traits of the new alpha. So I just want to share that and uh, say that being respectful, kind, compassionate is the future. It is the future I see in the digital agency environment. It's the future of my agency. Uh, spreading kindness is going to get you a lot further than spreading hate and negativity and all these different things. So uh, with that, that's it. So why don't we open it up for some questions? So you were telling a story earlier about a client that was uh, that kept on changing uh, requirements, right? Uh, my question is, uh, did you have a, a contract in place with that client? Yeah, this is my favorite favorite thing on the planet is when you have scope defined and client says, this actually happened this week. So we're working with a medical records company. I scoped out some work and they said, hey, so we're, uh, this is my client voice, by the way. So uh, it's, you know, three weeks away from our board meeting and um, I just wanna make sure that we have the production reports all scheduled out. We wanna test that in the next week. Oh, no problem. Hey there, just so we're on the same page. On September 9th, I let you know that this is not part of the scope of the project. It's not in the requirements. And uh, in writing, I stated that it's not part of scope. They come back and go, no, 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 no. Anne told me that John said, that Beverly said, that Joe said, you know, that whole thing. Uh, that, you know, it's included in scope and we should be doing this. Okay. You're dealing with people, so you gotta be in, in the, that moment, literally this week, I'm like process, 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 process before I knife myself. So I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking like, okay, cool. Let's just go and find more data, because um, that's the one thing I didn't share, is I'm data guy, and I will go right to the data and the, the documentation. So I said, no problem, let me just go and grab the proposal for you. So I went and screenshotted our time system to say that, hey, we put 6,000 into your site where I charged you 2,500. Oh, by the way, here's the proposal, which that piece is not included. And then crickets. And so when you get crickets, you know you're onto something. Either they're super pissed or you, or you got them. And uh, she came back and said, okay, yeah, can you go ahead and give me an estimate for the production reports? And that's, that's the end of that, and I gave the estimate. So, the thing about it is like, you're dealing with people and literally every situation is gonna be different and um, it's just how it goes. Uh, there's, there's other cases though where maybe you are under budget and because I work with the team, I'll say, you know, they're like, hey, can we have these uh, breadcrumbs over here in this sidebar over there and um, add in this new thing, and I'll go and look at budget and say, hmm, all right, well, we're about 5,000 under budget, so I think that's gonna take about 1,200 in effort, so I will follow up and say, you know what, this is not included in the scope of the project, but we're just gonna take care of this for you, I got it. So I don't, does that answer your question? It varies by situation. The, the biggest thing that you can uh, lean on is your documentation. So that's why from a development standpoint, every single project that comes through, whether it's for Jane Doe's Plumbing or Vancouver Clinic, which I write requirements for both, um, you always have that document. Even if it's like a basic five page site, because what can you do afterwards? Something comes up and the, the client has seen the requirements too, by the way. Um, you share the requirements, say, this is what we talked about looks like you want to add a feature, I can make a, a change order for you. And 
Uh, this is this is something I think actually Doug taught me this. So I can't remember, but the answer is I'll never no. It's always yes, and here's how much. So, understanding your scope and nailing it down is critical. Vancouver Clinic, when we built out the site, it was over a six-figure project, and the requirements was about 43 pages that I wrote. We had a three-hour meeting. We sat down and went line by line and confirmed all the details. Even though we did that with a committee of 10 people, literally, um, they came back towards the end of the project and said, hey, where's the star ratings for the doctors? It's like, guys, that's not, like you, like you literally signed on the requirements. And so again, being able to rely on that documentation and say, it's right here, it's not in the scope, it's not in the signed off requirements, we can absolutely do that for you. It's gonna be about 30 more hours of development. It says right there there's a podcast. What is, what is that? What is it about? Yeah, so I try and keep up with all the things. Um, so I post content regularly, but I also have a podcast called Crafting Creatives. So you can look that up on Stitcher. Um, I'm posting it to YouTube as well, iTunes, um, Google Play, somewhere else. SoundCloud. SoundCloud. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I have that podcast. I, I interview some creatives in the area, plus I share a lot of deep personal stories, too. Cool. Yeah. Other questions? So you showed like over six websites mm -hmm. in the PowerPoint, and I was wondering, are all those websites working, or you just designed them? Um, some of them are in the development phase currently. Uh, let me go up in here. So, here we go. Um, the left one, the, the green one is, well, it's kind of green, but uh, left one is done, the yellow one is done, the one on the right is in development, and the Giuliano's one was a free comp that I produced for the client who's very budget sensitive and uh, presented it and they said no thanks. Uh, not because they didn't like the design, but because they felt what they have works. So if you want a little treat afterwards, go look up Giuliano's Pizza, <laughs> check out their amazing site, and uh, yeah, it's good stuff. Um, it's amazing how, how even when you want to give stuff away, sometimes people won't take it just out of the ego. It's just insane. When was that Giuliano's website created? Just for kicks. What's that? When was that original? The yeah. Uh, gosh, five months ago? No, the, the Giuliano site? The current site. Okay, is that the one that you, when they said no thanks, they wanted to keep the one that was working? They wanted to keep their current site, okay. which is pretty horrific. Which was developed when? Can we, can we see? Um, yeah, yeah, see. yeah, yeah, So. It is very basic, if I remember correctly. It's fast. It's a fast loading <laughs> site. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe they're worried about performance concerns. Uh, oh, wow, there you go. <laughs> so. And so how long has this site been around? Oh, gosh. I'm Forever. Right. That's my, that was my question. Yeah, probably 10 years, huh? And then my next question, uh, Jason, was going to be, what's the typical longevity of a site that you develop? Uh, these days, right? Um, so these days, I would say our, my actual end game with where the agency is going now is to develop sites that last forever until technology changes. WordPress changes, I'm out of Gutenberg now, which is, drives me insane, but um, the intention is to build sites and manipulate over time and understand and get the collective uh, small business world to a point where they understand that sites are no longer a stagnant, non-changing thing. They change all the time. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned before that a lot of agencies are starting to get like retainers, and when you said that, and with what you just said, I thought of the quote-unquote subscription model, yep. where 
you charge them just enough to make just enough changes to keep their, their site relevant and current. Correct. Yep. Uh, we have some, Web4 has about 95 current active clients, a uh, bunch of marketing clients, a bunch of hosting and maintenance clients, a bunch of web projects. And uh, through the web projects and the marketing projects, sometimes we just throw in design stuff and new site changes just because they're a client we want to deliver value. Um, but you know, it's amazing what, what stubbornness can do to people. Uh, because I, I comped this, this site out and uh, I couldn't give it to them. Like it, didn't, it, didn't, it wasn't just that I designed something. I was gonna build it and set up all of their, the whole environment, everything. And they're like, yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's great. And they kind of like nodded me out the door. Which is, is fine. There's probably emotions involved in that original site. Uh, emotions, sometimes just ego. That like too. Being able to just step away and understand that other people might know how to do something better and more efficiently than someone else. So yeah, th there's a couple here. Uh, WSU I work with currently, build out landing pages for them. I've comped that, that's part of what's in here. Coronation is also developed, um, the two in the middle are not. And then only the one on the right is developed. The three on the left are in progress in mm -hmm. terms of approval. Yeah, and for the students in the class, in, in my web design one class, which is CGT205, uh, I introduced students to Adobe XD during the first week of class. Uh, we're gonna continue with that and we're gonna include Sketch as well. So they'll get both sides uh, of, you know, the Adobe product and the Sketch. The product. versatility and exposure is critically important. Yeah. I mean, I, I spoke with someone recently and um, I asked, they said, oh, I'm a web designer. I said, great, what are you designing it? Photoshop. Okay, let's, that's fine. Um, but they also didn't know what Adobe XD was or what Sketch was, which tells me they're not staying up with some of the newer trends. Not saying they're better trends, but that they just didn't know those things existed. Uh, one quick side story, the two comps in the middle, it's actually the one on the right with the split hero area up there is the seventh iteration and it's coming off the back of a client that is believes that they themselves are creative and they are in their own right but that also makes them feel like they have full creative license and so delivering a comp that they're happy with is extremely challenging and so i've recomped the the site like four or five times are those xd artboards Everything that I have up here is XD, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with backing up files in case there's like a fire? Hmm. Yeah, that's that's one I've been struggling with. So uh, there's a couple things. I use Adobe Creative Cloud, so I uh, use their drive, and all my design assets go in that drive. Then I also duplicate them and put them on Google Drive. Then I also have an external drive. So if the house burns down, well, that's okay because I got <laughs> I got Drive and I got uh, Creative Cloud and I'm set. So I struggled with that though from a video standpoint because anyone who's done video knows that it's just huge amounts of files and I literally have thousands and thousands of hours of video. So how do you back up all those video files? Same way? So it'd be fun to take a picture of this, but um, every about every year I buy a new external drive and take the old drive and copy that to the new drive plus all my new stuff and put it on that drive and then I take that new drive and when I can uh, get my hands on another drive then I make a duplicate of that. And then at one point, I was sending drives elsewhere. Like my parents had three, um, I have four, and um, one is somewhere else. It was at my fiance's house, but then we moved in together, 
So now it's my house or our house. So I'm going to sneak one more question in front of the students because I know they have more uh, before Robin is. What are two technologies that are on your mind right now that you wish you had more time to explore? Wearables. Wearables, okay. And um, obviously watches, but uh, eyewear, you know, glasses. Um, the, the rumor is that Apple's working on glasses with technology integrated into them. And um, it'll be interesting to see. The other thing is VR, because I can see us in a future where we no longer or don't um, have as many monitors. And when you go into your agency and you sit down and work, you're grabbing your goggles and working in your virtual space and moving assets around with a mouse or motion-driven stuff. So that's those are areas I'm okay. interested in. That was three. I only asked for two, but yeah, no extra credit for you. Robin. Um, you spoke earlier about um, that agencies were looking for people that fit into their culture. And I, and I kind of have a couple of questions about that. Yeah. So how do you know as uh, somebody that's uh, trying to look for these people that the person is going to fit or not fit? That's one question. And then the other one is kind of, um, uh, so have you ever uh, had like an interview where that you felt that, uh, that you weren't going to fit and so you decided to not go with it? That, that um, I've interviewed somewhere? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the first part, uh, Web4 is core values is an acronym, uh, KidFet, knowledge, innovation, dedication, empathy, and transparency. So when we go through the hiring process, we look for those characteristics. And by the way, sometimes we will hire uh, based on culture over skill set when we're able to ascertain that an individual seems to have the drive and the core value system and can be trained on how to be a social media advertising specialist. Um, in terms, you know, if, if you're looking for a job, and one time I was looking for a job, you have to cast, first of all, you have to cast a wide net. So one of the things I always tell myself in the job, when I get into job hunt mode, is to reach out and get as many opportunities as you can to sit down with somebody, even if it's stalking them on the street or uh, five minutes at a coffee shop or you know, uh, actually getting time in office because there's no downside of being interviewed um, anywhere. And what, I, what I'm getting to with that is that you're creating another connection, you're meeting somebody. You may already know you're not going to be a fit there uh, you might go into it going, yeah, I don't want to work for this company, but I still, and I've, this has happened in the past where I still go and do the interview or I sit down and talk with them. To my point earlier then, if it doesn't fit with them, maintaining a connection or relationship or attempting to might lead to an end result of them knowing someone else who's looking for someone like you, and that might be a better fit for you all together. There are certainly times where we thought we nailed it on hiring, and we didn't. You know, we hire based on values, and uh, sometimes people sell themselves really, really well, and um, they do a lot of research. Then they come in, and um, they create more friction than was expected. And um, Web4 has never fired anybody. We've always mutually parted ways, and we, when we know it's at a point where there's too much friction, that individual knows it, and they see it, and they're looking for an out, and we see it, and we'll oftentimes sit down or have in the past and said, it's not working out, and if we can't do this, then we should probably part ways. And when we've gone down that road, we've helped those people find jobs and places that were better fits for them. 
sense here. Question? So how large are you guys? Uh, we are, so we're like 14 or 15 internally, and then we have between three to six contractors that we work with at any given time. Uh, I'm gonna go here first. Um, you guys talked about communication. Um, do you guys use like online communication for your small group, or is it like there in person? Because that makes like a huge difference between for like web design, um, being online than in face. So you guys, which one do you guys use? So we we tell telecommute two days a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays we get to work from wherever we want, and uh, we use Slack, and it's just a mix of Slack, email, and in person. Okay. Except one of the things that we've done. I've done is inform everybody of what those channels are for. You know, don't necessarily submit a 12 item punch list to me in Slack because that's not the best way for me to keep track of that because of the threads of things that are going on in those discussions. So we also have our project management software which is Active Collab um, and we put nodes and tasks and there's discussion threads inside of there too. More often than not, we try and keep project discussions and heavy project discussions out of Slack and instead on tasks and discussion boards inside of our uh, project management software. So are, 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 are you guys designers and developers? No, so we have, we have um, our team is pretty much 70% marketing team and 30% web. Um, but we are moving in a position where we're, we're going to be more 30-30-30, so 30% creative, 30% paid advertising, 30% organic SEO. And so the web team is scaling right now. We have uh, myself, two producers, and full-time developer. One producer manages projects and leans creative. The other producer project manage it, uh, project manage manages web projects and it leans uh, developer. So we've kind of balanced things out in that way. Um, just actually just our developer um, is currently the one who's 100% focused on developing out work. But we have a workflow where uh, Jake produces his uh, produces a comp initially and the whole environment and the interior layouts then that gets handed off to a producer who basically finishes out the site. And that flow has been working really well for us. What would you say is your favorite comp you did? Uh, favorite comp that I've done? I would say, you know, it's a good question. Um, I would say this one here, which is too tiny for everyone to see. Um, oops. Wrong button. It's the one on the left uh, called Crawl Source. And it's been my favorite comp so far just because of the sort of wacky edges and the, the sort of bear shape, California bear shape that's in the bottom right of that hero area. So that's been my favorite one so far. So, Jason, having gone to Clark uh, maybe a little bit longer than you wanted to. What was one thing that you wish that we would have taught you here that we didn't? Design. More design. Gotcha. Web design. Gotcha. That's a very fair answer. Yeah, so when I went, it was Dreamweaver. And Dreamweaver class was a blend of coding and design. <clears throat> and uh, if you go through the development program at that time, you learn all about coding. And so when I was going through the graphics communications program, I was hoping that the web, like the web design class was actually web design, as in graphical design and not mm -hmm. development. Okay. Any other questions for Jason today? Um, I have Trisha? a little one. Go ahead. Just remind me what PEST stands for, patience. I have to remind myself. Okay. Um, patience. It's in here somewhere. Effort. Effort. Self awareness. It's technically two words. I, I get it, but I wanted to keep it short. That's good. Passat, yeah. <laughs> Transparency. Transparency. Um, 
being patient, putting in the energy and the effort, you know, working towards your goals. And then just one other question. Have you ever played around with Muse in the Adobe ecosystem? Not yet. Okay. All right. Any other questions for Jason today? Uh, That's so what skills uh, are you looking for your developers to have? Great question. <laughs> um, from a skill standpoint, Pixel, so developers who have pixel perfect development skills. If I pass a comp to you and you approved it in that developer approval, and it goes through the whole funnel, gets approved by the client, then the hope is that what was designed is what's developed. And you don't always get that. There's, there's a Plenty of developers who, and there's a workflow for this by the way, but there's plenty of developers who just kind of like build all the initial stuff and it looks kind of close and then someone comes in behind and kind of scrubs it and, and gets to where it needs to be. But if I would say that more often than not, agencies are going to look for someone who has the well-rounded skills and capabilities to take a sketch comp, an Adobe XD comp, an Illustrator comp, turn it into code have it be nearly pixel perfect. Every pixel has an owner. <laughs> okay. Is that it? Any other questions for Jason? All right, big round of applause for Jason. <laughs>